Amen. If you have a copy of God's Word, maybe it's on your iPhone, your iPad, or you brought a copy of the Bible, that's fine. Go ahead and pull it out. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 is we're continuing in our series, Between Two Worlds, a, a verse-by-verse, a text-by-text study of the book of 1 Peter. Now, we'll be diving into the end of chapter 2 a little bit, but that'll be at the end of the sermon. Your main focus right now needs to be 1 Peter chapter 3 in the first seven verses of that chapter. This is a Mother's Day sermon. So first of all, moms, happy Mother's Day. Every time I come to Mother's Day, as a pastor, the challenge is, okay, what text can be applied to both moms and others and bring honor to God? So you're always searching through it. Now, the blessing is when the text that you already happen to be in for that week lines up perfectly with Mother's Day. And today is that day. In 1 Peter chapter 3, especially in verses 1 through 7, we're going to have a special message for moms. But because many moms are also wives, we're going to have a special message, application for wives. And because moms are, first of all, women, I think there's some great application for women in general. And for husbands who are also part of the home, there's application for you. And guess what? Everybody else has application this morning through the example of Christ. I think I could preach many more years and not come to a particular passage like this that just happens to be where we're supposed to be in the, fir- the book of 1 Peter and it be so broad yet focused in its application. I'm excited for it. Let's look at it together. Let's start reading in verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 3. In the same way Peter starts here, meaning in the same way that he's been talking about submission to authority, he says, wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that if any of them are disobedient to the word, that's Peter telling you, if any of them are unbelievers, that they may be one, meaning one to faith, without a word, by the behavior of their wives, as they, meaning the husbands, observe your chaste and respectful behavior. That's Amazing. We must go on. Verse 3. Your adornment, he says, which means your beauty, must not be merely external. Braiding of the hair, wearing gold jewelry, and putting on dresses. Now, those particulars may not apply today, but you get the idea. External beauty. But let it, your beauty, be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God, who, by the way, is the only one that matters. Verse 5, For in this way, the former, in the former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children, if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Let's go ahead and get that question out of the way. Prayers be hindered? How can my prayers be hindered by how I do or don't love my wife? I think it's a pretty easy answer. Men and women alike, you tell me how good your prayer life is when you're living in disobedience to God. Not loving your wife properly. Not living with her in an understanding and considerate way. That's being disobedient to God. And it's just like any other time in your life when you're disobedient to God. Your prayer life is is affected because when you're not obeying the Lord, who wants to talk to Him? Right? When you're straying away from Him, you don't go to Him in prayer. You probably should, but we usually don't. Order in the home, I think, is a beautiful picture here. I believe as citizens of heaven, we honor God by following the example of Christ in respect, submission, and consideration towards others. The application, wives and women and mothers and husbands and children alike. Let's start in the first six verses here. In honoring the example of Christ, Peter is saying that wives respect their husbands through submission. As soon as we utter those words in a modern society, I believe we need to take a step back and have what I would call a contextual 
discussion. We're 2,000 years removed from the particular context of this passage. And I think it's important to understand who Peter is writing to. And if we don't have that contextual discussion, I fear that we might lose some of the timely application for women and wives today because we'll be confused. The passage will seem to you distant and outdated and words like archaic, and it might even be offensive to you. So to prevent that, let's dive into the context a little bit more. When Peter discusses household instructions directed towards wives specifically, it comes in an ancient societal context that we simply do not live in today. Much the same way as Peter was talking to slaves and masters last week. None of you are masters and none of you are slaves. We, we don't allow such obscene things in our society today. So we have to understand the context then. And just because Peter addressed it, meaning slavery last week, didn't mean that he supported it or that God was pleased with slavery. Instead, we know that the overall teaching of Scripture, the overall teaching of the Bible, is actually opposed to such atrocities. So likewise, when Peter writes to wives, it comes in the context of women having very little to say in their society. It comes in the context of women having little to no authority and therefore having little to no respect in the society in which they lived 2,000 years ago. In the Greco-Roman society, many women today would consider that society as oppressive towards women. 100% you would feel like that. Therefore, a wife would have not really expected to have any kind of life, listen to this, outside of her husband and outside of her home. Friendships, for example, outside of her husband would have been frowned upon. And the expectation for a wife would have been much the same as a slave. To want what the husband wanted. Is that how it should be today? No, but that's the way it was. A wife would have been expected to worship the gods that her husband worshipped. The fact, the simple fact that Peter addressed believing wives directly is astonishing. The fact that he speaks to them, and not through the vehicle of the husband, but to them directly. And the fact that he assumed that they could and should have a faith that existed outside of their husband would have been contrary to societal expectations. This is just truth. And in this context is what Peter has to write in. He has to balance a woman understanding her identity in Christ her freedom as a believer while maintaining order in the home in the society of Asia Minor 2,000 years ago. And I want to tell you, it was a challenge for him then, and it can often be a challenge for pastors today for different reasons, but still a challenge. See, Christians were already being accused, like we oftentimes are today, of creating some kind of upsetting public disorder with this new and all-powerful God that they worshiped with these high standards and these moral expectations. New Testament scholar Karen Jobes puts it like this. She says, Peter was trying to both, both uphold and subvert social order. I think that's my job sometimes, to help you live in the world of 2021 today. But yet at the same time, where today is contrary to the scriptures, I also want to, for the sake of the gospel, subvert social order. It's a challenge then and it's a challenge now. Clearly, I'll tell you this, the message of Scripture was then and is now that men and women are equal before God in their value. Yet, the Bible also says when it's considering the home, they are different in their application and their roles in the household. So it's a challenge then, I think that's still a challenge now. This is why you'll hear me say the phrase concerning men and women, husband and wives, equal, because we are, but different. Don't we almost kind of feel guilty for saying that in our society today? Equal, but, but different? The truth is, men and women, they're different. Some of it's pretty <laughs> obvious, and some of it's less obvious. And the society is trying to blend the confusion, right? Blend the lines. We have to clarify the lines without being dismissive or oppressive. And whoa, what a great challenge it is. Notice that Peter doesn't go into great detail about what that respect and submission looks like in the home particularly. He simply makes the point that respect and submission is necessary for wives then 
and I would even say now, throughout time. Wives, let me help you. From passages like Ephesians 5, it's out of reverence for Christ and in following your Savior's example that you as wives should submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. This idea of submission, yes, I understand. It's been misapplied and abused from passages like this one by misogynists for years. But that doesn't mean that just because it's been misapplied and abused that we can throw the idea out the window altogether because it's for the sake of the gospel. It's an obedience to Christ and so we must understand the beauty of it in our lives. I think submission can be and should be a wonderful and beautiful thing in all of our lives. It was just last week, which is why I love walking through the text verse by verse, that I had to learn that I submit to and honor Christ through my submission to governmental and vocational authorities. And sometimes I just don't want to. Sometimes that submission is hard for me, but I honor Christ by doing it anyway the best way that I can. So wives submit to their Savior out of respect and appreciation for what he did for them on the cross. They therefore then extend the same respect to their husbands, not just for the sake of the husbands, but for the sake of Christ. No, we don't live 2,000 years ago. I get that. And therefore, societal expectations for a woman are not the same today as they were then. But the principle that Peter is talking about here, the principle, especially as it's worked out in the home, it still applies. And much the same way, Peter left up the daily application of submission and respect to the couple 2,000 years ago. Here's what I want to do. I want to leave the, the daily application of respect and submission as the word. I'm giving it to you as couples. Now you go and apply it for the glory of God to your home. You say, well, pastor, that's nice. But I need maybe some clear clearer examples of what that might look like in 2021. I don't know if I have all the answers for you. Can I just be honest with you? I have the scripture. I can tell you what it means in the context, but the daily application has to be worked out by you. I can tell you what it looks like in my family, and I can tell you this. Neither oppression nor manipulation has anything to do with it. If you all know Tammy at all, you know she wouldn't stand for oppression. Not, not one second, by the way. Even as I hinted to it early in the marriage, she stomped that up pretty quick. And God also worked, worked on her heart and what it means in submission. We're a work in prosperous. I never want to take advantage of her or mistreat her, but I know what the Bible says. And the Bible says this for me and my home, and I believe it probably is similar for you, that Tammy and I are equal in worth and value before God for our salvation. But I also know that she and I have different roles. I know that I am called to lead, protect, provide, and spiritually guide my home. That's my duty. And Tammy knows that she is to support me and nurture our home. And we do this together. Now listen to me. Our spiritual roles are not completely interchangeable. But we help one another in our roles in a myriad of ways as equal partners in our salvation. You're like, that sounds nice. Those are probably all the right words. But can you, can you take that one step deeper? I can. But again, you have to take this home. You have to. It can't just be from me to you. It has to work itself out in your family. What you're really asking probably is, what does that look like when you make decisions? Now, that's a good question. Many couples ask the same question. A vast majority of the time, when we make a decision in our home, we make what I would call and label a combined decision. Sometimes, in fact, many times, because my wife is just brilliant, you probably think the same thing about your wife, I think her idea is better. So we make a combined decision to do it her way. There may be some application for you there, guys. Other times, and Tammy would say, because you always feel like this, many times she agrees with my way. And so we, get the we, make a combined decision to do it my way. That's still combined decisions. Now, the question you're really asking is, what happens when you don't agree? 
Well, on rare occasion when we don't agree and we stay on opposite sides of the issue, can I tell you, my wife chooses out of respect for me and her honor for her Savior to submit to my decision. Why? In those rare occasions would she do that? Because she trusts her Savior more than me. And she chooses to follow him through me. Can I tell you today that submission is not forced and it cannot be manipulated. The moment, wives, you try to manipulate with submission, it's not submission. Goes the same for the husbands. Husbands, the moment you try to force submission, guess what? It's not submission. Submission has to be given out of love for Christ for it to be submission. You say, why is that, Pastor? Because that's the example Jesus gave us. He is the model. We're gonna find it at the end of the sermon so beautifully at the end of chapter two. He is the model for respect and he is the model for submission and God never forced him nay one time. He gave himself over to it for the glory of God. This particular passage goes on and it's amazement for me. It says that many wives have unbelieving husbands, and Peter says that by her honoring behavior, through her respect and submission, even to her unbelieving husband, he might be won over to the gospel. Without a word. That's hard to believe, but I've seen it happen in my own family. This goes back to one of the main thrusts of the letter. Peter wants Christians to conduct their relationships. Peter wants Christians to live their lives in such a way that it is a good testimony for Christ so that we can see the unbelieving and lost world saved, even if that lost world starts in your home. Peter simply wanted a wife to represent Christ in her home to her husband with good and respectful behavior. So moms and wives, I submit to you the same. I pray that you would desire the same that Peter calls you to and that God may be glorified. I can guarantee you this one thing, that the greatest thing that you can do for your children's mother is to let them watch you love and respect their father. Let your children watch you love and respect your husband. God will do miraculous things through that. So Peter gets past submission. I hope that has helped you. And then he goes on to this other subject that is timely for wives, but not just wives. I think all women and probably men as well, but particularly women. He speaks to them about their external beauty. How on time is that? Girls, single women, wives and mothers alike. He says in verse 3, your adornment must not merely be external. The braiding of the hair and wearing gold jewelry and putting on dresses and however you express your external beauty today. But let it be your beauty, the hidden person of the heart, internal beauty, which is an imperishable quality that includes gentleness and a quiet spirit. And this is precious in the sight of God. If you haven't noticed, I'm not a woman. (laughs) And therefore, I have very little personal knowledge of the burden and the expectation of beauty for you ladies today. But I can tell you this, I have a daughter. And I become increasingly aware of the society's pressure for her to seek external beauty and external beauty alone. And I can tell you, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Judging from Peter's words, it's always been that way. So I would tell you as moms and dads right here in the Bible, right here in the Bible in God's inspired word, he gives me a passage that I personally so desperately want my daughter to understand. A passage that I so desperately plead with all Christian women that are listening or may listen to this message in the future future, that you may understand. And here it is, that your beauty is more than external qualities. Your value is more than your looks. You have more to offer the world than what you wear, how you wear it, and what size it is. Far more. And you know that. What matters the most, Peter says, is your value to God. And what does God say is most valuable to him? Your inner beauty right here in the text is all you need to ever have. 
please, I plead with you, be more focused on your gentle and quiet spirit than you are on what you wear for others to see. Understand what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with you taking care of yourself. And it's a, it's a good idea. The problem comes when you place your value, your intrinsic value on how others look at you and how they desire you physically. That's the problem. And this is rampant in our society today. So instead of being an oppressive and objectifying text towards women, I believe Peter is placing value where it should be on a woman's mind, on a woman's spirit, who they really are, the whole person. And ladies, unless I misunderstand you, this is what you want as well. So if you want the world to see your external beauty alone, then keep doing the things that the world says do today. But if you want the world to see you and to respect you for inner beauty, for your mind and for your spirit, then you must invest in the things that create inner beauty. Intellectual things. Things of the mind, things of the heart, things of the soul. Spiritual disciplines like prayer, Bible reading, and fasting. A modest approach to clothing and adornment so when the world looks at you, they know that you care more about what's on the inside than what's on the outside. Moms, you must teach this to your daughters to seek inner beauty instead of giving in to the most modern trends of clothing or behavior. Can I tell you that if you don't want your daughters to be valued for their body alone, then you are the ones that have to teach them otherwise. And your example, can I say this again, moms? Your example must shine for them to see. Show them how to love themselves. Show them how to value other women instead of comparing themselves to other women. Put more emphasis on the weight of their character than you do to the number on a scale. I've seen so many daughters in my office struggling because every time they go and speak with their mother, their conversations revolve around the number on the scale. What does that matter to God? And if it does matter, is it of most importance that that should be the priority that you speak about? I don't think so. I know it's a lot of pressure. I live in the same society you do. I know the expectation from young boys to old men, and we need to take some ownership of that. But even though it's tough, I pray that you would fight the good fight. They emulate you, moms. They watch you whether you realize it or not. And if you're not careful, your insecurities will become your daughter's insecurities. That's called generational sin. But you have the power to stop it right now. So teach them to love the whole of the person. Inside mainly, yes, and outside secondarily. Teach them to love every unique, wonderful aspect that God intricately stitched together in his image that he gave them to be and to call themselves woman. This is so good. Peter goes into a final summary of submission and he gives the example of Old Testament followers of Christ or followers of Yahweh and the coming Messiah like Sarah. They submitted to and respected their husbands, he says. What's interesting about the relationship between Sarah and Abraham is it was far more unified and combined than you might think. They made these combined decisions as well. In fact, we often see Abraham obeying and giving in to the suggestions of his wife Sarah, probably like me, because he thought they were better. And that's okay. We don't know exactly what Peter's talking about as he's honoring and highlighting Sarah's service to her husband, but we do know that tradition tells us that Sarah was a model of respect and submission. I can tell you this, when I read the Old Testament, I see that when needed, Sarah gave way to the desires of her husband for the benefit of her husband and for the benefit of their family, even when she didn't always understand and surely probably didn't agree. You're like, Pastor, when did that happen? Go back and read Genesis chapter 20. This is crazy. Sarah went along with Abraham when he wanted her to pretend to be his sister instead of his wife in the court of Abimelech. That could have caused some problems. Abimelech thinking that a single woman is, his, is, is in his court. Just look at the story of ba David and Bathsheba. I would say, what trust? 
Was Abraham wrong? Yeah. But what did God do? I believe God chose to bless her support of Abraham as he spoke to Abimelech and showed the couple favor and restored Sarah to her husband, not only by themselves, but with gifts. Also, there's a distraction here. There's a couple distractions in verse 6 and verse 7. If you're a woman and you're listening to this passage as I read it, you probably must have said, what was that all about when she called him Lord? And what in the world does that mean as a, uh, as a lesser or a weaker vessel? We're going to talk about both. Don't let verse 6 distract you. This is not saying that Abraham went home and expected his wife to call him Lord. Okay, Guys, don't try that at the house. It's not going to work. Cody and I joke because we're working on her master's degree that I got my master's degree and when I went home I just waited for my wife to call me master I'm still waiting and then that's why I pursued my doctorate I guess no not really but just so she would call me doctor and guess what she doesn't call me doctor either so why did Sarah call Abraham Lord can I help you understand it was a term of respect that she told other people out of reverence for him, indicating that Sarah, listen to this, willingly placed her life and her family under Abraham's leadership, which was under God's sovereign control, and she knew it. Of course, there is a timely question that you may be asking, and so I will submit it on your behalf, ladies. How far is too far in submission? Does submission have its limits? For example, you might be asking, does submission require me as a woman to put up with abuse abuse under a violent husband? No, not at all. We see no support of such things in this passage of Scripture, nor do we see it in Scripture. If you're in an abusive situation, I'll tell you this, leave immediately. Leave immediately. Find somewhere safe for you and your children. I'm going to offer this to you. Contact the church for help. Contact me personally. We will, and I can guarantee this, I will help you. And then let God worry about what he's going to do with your husband and you. Find safety. In these verses, if they empower anyone here today that leans towards the oppression of women, let me help you. You're reading the verses wrong. You are wrong, and if I see it, I will personally attack it immediately. I have little patience. In fact, I say I have no patience for weak men preying on women to feel better about their inadequacies. Stop it. Wives, honor Christ by respecting your husbands. Would you take the challenge of giving him leeway to lead your family? And pray for him. Was he going to mess up? He's going to need your grace and the grace of God to try and try again. But if you'll give him that rope and that leeway, and he's following Christ, oh, what a great leader you could have. What a great spiritual leader that could be waiting for you. And until it happens, pray for him. Husbands, you don't get off the hook either today. Look at verse 7. Husbands, Peter says, be considerate and honor your wives. The text tells husbands to live with their wives in an understanding way. The Net Bible says, treat your wives with consideration. The Greek word here that we translate understanding and consideration is the Greek word gnosis, and it means to know. It means to understand. Husbands, if you want a wife that respects your leadership at home, you need to be the kind of husband that knows his wife. You need to be the kind of husband that considers his wife before he considers himself. And if you're going to know her, If you're going to understand her, just like any other subject in this world, you're going to have to do what? Study her. Which means you're going to have to listen to her. You're going to have to talk with her to get her to speak to you. Notice I didn't say talk at her. I'm pretty good at that. Notice I didn't say talk down to her. The Bible doesn't say that either. No, talk with her, study her, understand her more. And when you are talking with her, guess what? You don't always have to fix the problem. Why do I say that? Because I feel like I'm the master problem fixer with anybody's problems, and it's just not true. Sometimes my wife, when she's speaking to me, she doesn't need me to fix the problem. I'm so bad at this, I did this yesterday with my daughter. Sometimes you're, the women in your life just need you to listen, to listen to them, to understand them, to know them, and to consider them. 
And if they ask you, then you can try to fix the problem. Notice I didn't say fix them. Husbands can oftentimes take advantage of their wife's extended kindness and generosity. Can I tell you, don't be that guy? Don't be that guy that just takes and takes and takes. No, stop that. Do as Peter says here. Do what Paul says in Ephesians 5. Consider her. Study her. Understand her. And love her like Christ loves you. Okay, verse 7. Don't get thrown off by this weaker partner comment. It's not near as offensive then as it might be for you today. Can I help you? Peter is not saying lesser when he says weaker. He is simply trying to get husbands to step up to the role that God called them to be to protect their wife. Likely, he's referencing the fact that women are physically weaker just so he can share this truth with them to remind the husband of his duty. Now, I understand today that a woman doesn't need the protection of a man like she did 2,000 years ago. I understand today that the woman doesn't need the provision of a man as much as she did 2,000 years ago. She can go out and get a job on her own and become just as successful as he is and maybe even more so. But I want you to understand, guys, just because that's true today doesn't alleviate you from the principle that it's your job when the rubber meets the road. It's your duty to protect and to provide for your family. The Bible's clear. I have four key roles in my home. I'm to be the priest, the prophet, the provider, and the protector. Do I have to do that alone? No. But the buck stops with me for those responsibilities. Peter also reminds the husbands that they should honor their wives because he says they are co-heirs of grace. See, rather than this being an oppressive passage like some want to make it, Peter here reminds the husbands in the room today that your wife is your equal in the eyes of God. You can't get oppression out of that. God's grace in Christ is not reserved for men and men alone. It never has been and it never will be. Her worth and value is the same as yours. And she deserves to be treated as such. So let's get to it. Have you considered your wife this Mother's Day? Have you honored your wife this Mother's Day? Have you honored and considered your mother today? I think consideration, and wives, I would hope you would agree with me, consideration is a wonderful gift on a day like today. And it can come in the smallest yet most meaningful ways. What about making your wife the dinner that you know she likes to eat and then doing the dishes afterwards? Wives, would that be a small consideration? Now, what about if you go to lunch or dinner today, if you go to the place that she wants to go to and not the place that you want to go to? What about if you buy your wife a gift or you buy your mom a gift, you give her a gift because you studied her, you understand her, and you know what she wants and what she needs, even if it's not expensive. If she knows you care, it'll mean a lot to her. Consideration can go far beyond Mother's Day, by the way. You can consider your wife at home, if you know there's things in the home that she doesn't like to do, what about if you just do them for her every once in a while? It's little things like that. I know they seem small, but I think they can have a wonderful impact. Consideration is a fantastic gift. Honor her, listen to her, tell her how special she is to you on a daily basis. Okay, I know these verses have been challenging on Mother's Day, both for wives and moms and women and husbands alike, but I saved the best for last. Let's quickly go to the application in verses 21 through 25. Here we have what I would consider the theological epicenter for the entire book, sandwiched right in the middle of Peter's letter. Jesus Christ is both the basis and the model for all Christian living. Whether you're a man or a woman, whether it's inside the home or outside the home, we are all to follow in his steps. So if you're here today and you're a woman and you're a wife, and you struggle with these commands from Peter, please know that it's Christ that is your ultimate example of respect and submission. Husbands, if you're here today and you struggle with considering and understanding and loving and honoring your wife, can I tell you that it's also Christ who is your example? It's Christ who considered you and put you above himself every day of his life until he breathed his last. If you're here today and you're watching online and the only reason you're listening is because of your mom or to be here for a family member and you would say, Pastor, I'm struggling. Guess what? 
Christ in verses 21 through 25 is the answer for you as well. He died in your place. He rose from the dead. So that if you today would repent and believe, you could be saved and have a clear path to follow for the rest of your life. What an awesome gift that would be to your mother on Mother's Day than to surrender to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. All of our call is to follow him. So let's just read these verses and let them be our final application in their entirety. For you have been called for this purpose, Peter says in verse 21 of chapter 2. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. And then he quotes Isaiah 53. Who committed no sin, nor is any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he did not utter threats. But he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds we have been healed. For you, husbands and wives and sons and daughters, are continually straying like sheep. But now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Jesus Christ is your shepherd, wives. Follow him in respect and submission. Jesus Christ is your guardian, husbands. He is your overseer. Listen to him and how you should consider, understand, and honor your wives. He died for you and rose from the dead so that we could be better sons, daughters, husbands, wives, and mothers for his glory.